she's going to talk about her work. Erin Polinsky. Ah, thank you. Um, so, let's see. We need to pro I'm looking at my time, and I want to make sure I get people out of here at the right time. People, do people need to be somewhere at 1 o'clock for their classes? We will probably go up to 1240, 1245. Okay. And then you can ask their okay. You looked up here like there was a clock somewhere. It's difficult for you, I think. Yes. You got your clock? The phone there. Okay, 1212, got it. I can make this easy. All right. I just don't want to hold anybody up, and I want to keep my, I found my clock here. It is right on there. So, thank you. Um, well, thank you very much for having me here. It's been lovely. I feel like there's a lot of energy um, in the studios. Like, I kind of love that they're trashed in a way. Like, that means things are happening. Things are making. Sometimes when it's too sterile, there's not enough activity going on. Um, I'm going to uh, talk a little bit about, about my earlier work. I often do that with students, and people were talking to me about my path and choices I've made. So I will show you. Oops, I have to do both buttons. Okay. Um, this is some of my uh, work that I applied to graduates with, to graduate school with. So I was doing earthenware, uh, vessels. Functional work, which is, I felt very uh, honest and approachable, those objects, and that attracted me. The groundedness, the association with the domestic environment that they had, but I was kind of bored with just like round plates and simple cups. So they were quite elaborate, and I did a fair amount of surface work on them. Uh, I'll, I'll show you a sampling of works that I made over about the last 15 years, and Oops, I keep forgetting to do both. So uh, on the right hand is a vessel, the ewer, oil and vinegar ewer that I made for my BFA show. And on the left hand side is a piece that I made, I think it was in about 2008. Uh, and you're going to see that there are some things that have changed, but then there's also some things that have stayed very true. Uh, an obvious element is the interest in pattern and how it works over volumetric forms. And there's often a lot of symmetric uh, uh, symmetry in the pieces and the scale of even my sculptures has remained relatively of a vessel size. Uh, one of, somebody asked me, oh, where do you get your patterns? What do you look at? And I think I look at a lot of things. Oops, go back one. Sorry. I'm trying to get my, I will, I'm going to do a little disclaimer. I'm doing my notes off of this computer and having to control this, so I'm controlling two things. So I have to, it's going to be a teeny bit clumsy, but otherwise I would speak, be speaking completely off the cuff, and I like to have something to go back to that are my words and reference there. So... I've looked at a lot of historical decorative arts, um, and I spent a few hours at your museum yesterday, and I was blown away by the ceramics collection there and just the decorative arts uh, collection that you have. You're very lucky to have that in your town. So I look at ceramic history, the decorative arts, and contemporary design. Um, I often look at nature. You see a lot of flowers on my work, but what I don't do is I rarely look at a flower and draw inspiration from that. I am looking at the interpretation of the natural environment that has been brought into the domestic world and drawing inspiration from that. So you can see how I may draw from how the lines are scrolling and rolling. This is a William Morris pattern. And I carve and paint stylized patterns of these scrolling lines and floral imagery onto my work. Uh, they cover it vine -like, in a vine-like pattern. And then there's the shifting and softening of the glaive, glaze that alters the form. So I went to graduate school, and it has to be this thing where you're like, okay, I've really got to like blow it up. I got to blow it out of the water. I got to change. I got to think. Um, and so I, <clears throat> I was like, okay, I need to change things. So I just went really straightforward, and I'm like, well, I'm just going to change my clay body. So I was using earthenware that has a very rustic, earthy sort of reference um, to uh, lower class. 
um, and more like peasant people in ceramic history. But yet I was looking and drawing inspiration from this like upper crust European like Sevres porcelain. And so I said, okay, I'm gonna just I'm gonna learn how to work with porcelain. So I did that, and um, I wanted to give more content to the work. So it comes out a little bit too strong. But so I explored a narrative um, for a little while. And like this is a this is a vessel that looks quite sculptural. So the design of this vessel is based on function, but it's quite elaborate and it causes the user to question the utilitarian aspect of the object. For example, you may wonder if there's actually butter under that grand dress like form. So these are butter dishes. And they also functioned as uh, vases, too, at the same time. So a lot of body image, coming at things with, you know, taking some women's studies classes, drawing that inspiration into my work, um, and also always being attracted to that curve and that, that structure of the, of the female form. So I was researching ceramic forms that were meant to contain objects besides food. Also, uh, there's a lot of that, and they're quirky, and they're weird, and so during the um, middle, the, during the 17th and 18th century, uh, English societies, like women were giving these toiletry sets, and they were for their makeup, and it was also like a rite of passage. I was interested in the ceremony. There's a lot of ceremony involved with ceramics, but often it's around food or, or drinking. Um, and so I was looking at some other things. So I looked at the elaborate qualities, the packaged and presented things, the, the people were packaged, the food. Um, and then I thought, okay, how could I bring that into my world? So I thought about, you know, like a young 20-something woman and bringing things that are typically hidden out into the front. So this is a little, this is a condom vessel, like a one-serving condom vessel, and there's like sexuality. And so I was talking about, I made vessels and like niches for things that were typically hidden away or tucked away, but were useful items in the home. So, uh, but you know, it felt like it was, I, I got, it was like a little bit of a one liner for me. So I got over it pretty quickly. Um, and at the same time I got engaged. And so I made this elaborate vessel for my engagement ring because everybody was asking me about it. It was just a very weird process, um, for this, this item to hold such weight. So I decided to make a vessel about, uh, about it. And yes, those are like little um, patterns on there but for me I thought about like it was like a badge all of a sudden I like joined this club and I thought about the Girl Scouts so I took, took <laughs> about like I got that shape from badges so a lot of times my work has like it just looks like pattern to you but there's a little bit of a story about how it came to be um, and this was an important piece because when it came out of the kiln, like many of you in ceramics have experienced, you were like, ah, oh, the glaze totally didn't do what I wanted it to do. Like, you think it's going to be this thing, and it ran, and I was so upset, and everybody else was like, no, it's great, and I was like, shut up, you don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> And so it just sat in my studio, and then it talked back to me, and then I was like, oh, I get it. Like, I just had to sit with it for a while. You can learn things retrospectively, and sometimes people say things, and, like, maybe you can't, he like, listen to them, but you can hear them, but still hold on to that. So um, it became an important piece because I loved how that glaze shifted, and I, I needed to let, let some control go. So now I intentionally do that. And at the same time, I took um, some printmaking, and I learned how to super control some of my imagery and how to layer them, how to get that graphic quality. So um, that precise, dense pattern that I was trying to do by hand, but instead it came off as like bad craftsmanship, I learned how to use some different techniques to do. So uh, I feel like it was really important. I began, print, I began printing right onto clay, um, but that works really well, but it's really challenging because I like really volumetric forms. And then how do you get these graphic 2D surfaces onto a volumetric form? Um, I also like the printing and the decals and other methods because it references mass production um, that is found in domestic uh, objects that most of us have in our space. So that, uh, that design wear 
Okay, so at that point, I was looking at a lot of domestic feminist themes, putting them into these pots, and I realized that my my vessels were just centerpieces and objects of display, and they were really not about the function. I was trying to make the function the content, and you know, you're struggling trying to figure it out. And then I came to terms with that it was easier for me to let go of the functional form, and it was a really important realization, and it was more interesting for me to create a connection between my work and the domestic environment and domestic objects, rather than to make objects that were for the domestic environment, like a vessel that you use in a daily way. So I thought about domestic objects that are used in daily. So um, this is a base on an iron and how it sits. So I began looking at um, objects that either are used every day in our world or historical. So Victorian furniture, I looked at at a lot of things that were um, in the drawing room, which was a traditional female domain, and the history of defining um, spaces that women would over-decorate them to become a, women, a woman's space, like to make things maybe pretty in order to claim them of their, as their own. Looking at the curvilinear lines, the ornate surfaces, the dramatic proportions, and then translating that into my own objects. So you can see how some of the proportions of those objects are directly influencing my pieces. Yet I wanted there to be a softness and an elegance to them. Um, I look at ceramic history and all the weird functional objects that are out there. So yet they're beautiful. And what is this desire to make things ornate um, when that object that looks like a globe, that's a wig stand. So at one point, it looks like a sculptural object, but it was there to like hold a very uh, specific function. So spittoons, headdress, um, this, what do you think this is? Teacup, that's what you think. It's actually called a bordeloo, and it was used for women um, in the big hoop skirts. It was too difficult to pee. So they would hoist them up, and it was like a little standing pea pot. So I'm enthralled, like very interested in this dichotomy of these weird functions, but yet the elaborate surface for them. Um, and it's still done to this day. What makes it okay for one person to use these tools? What, does that make somebody make an impulse buy at the checkout at Lowe's? Because they're like, ooh, I'll use that. Um, and the color, and even how it changes you psychologically, the history of ornament on armor um, to make somebody feel invincible. I just read yesterday at your museum, looking at the armor collection, that they, at a certain point, that the craftsmen who were those metal smiths who made that were the highest like ranked makers of that time, like they were the top-notch designers and craftsmen to make armor. Um, so, and how does that change us? So here's two things uh, of protection. And so on the left, it's called the Lady Taser, and it's marketed in lipstick pink for you to put in your purse for safety. Um, the structure and detail of clothing and form, and how clothing changes our shape, how we move, how it dramatizes certain areas. Um, these right there, I'll use my pointer. Those are called hobble skirts, and if you looked, they're cinched right at the bottom, very tightly, so the woman couldn't walk without moving and shaking her bottom very seductively, but I probably was not her choice, you know, my guess. Okay. And now you can see how some of those are, how that clothing and structure can ch is interpreted in my form. So I look at maybe fleshy things, but yet they're changed and they become more structural. Rarely are my pieces flat. Um, sometimes they are, but I, when you look at a form like that, you have this desire to reach under 
and explore it. I want there to be uh, a desire to touch, a tactile experience to come with the object. And uh, it, it also, I love the way it hovers. And that piece was funny because after it was made, I laid it down and I've looked at ceramic headdress a lot and then I just laid down and used it and it just like a mold of my own body, which I didn't even realize until it was done. Uh, I want them to appear quite egg-like, fragile and delicate with, you know, that pristine profile. And it's hard to get that. It's a real studio you know, challenge. It takes a lot, a lot. Like I think I've, and because I'm not working for molds, I think I've gotten a profile what right. I think I've gotten things like symmetrical. And I go to bed and I come back down and I think I'm moving on to doing something on the surface. And I'm like, ah, oh, more. And so I spend a lot of time scraping and honing down the forms. Um, but I love that process. So there's a sense of volume that I feel remains from working, coming from into ceramics, being working on that via, on the wheel. And the scale is still of that size. So uh, I also use a lot of decals on my work, like these flowers. And um, I'm aware of their cliché-ness, and I am okay with that, I, I want that. I want it to reference maybe a grandmother's teacup or a flower on a Hallmark card, like there's just this real approachability to it and a slight genericness. So I do a lot of glaze testing to develop the exact surfaces that I want. And um, how to get those surfaces to run just the right amount or shift or say stay satin and seductive. Um, you can see the multi-firings that take place and how the, the decal will sit on the front and alters. So you can see that flower, but that, that white then over the orange, how it shifts it and it softens it and it doesn't stand out as much. Uh, I use you know, quiet things such as white decals and gold that you may that don't jump out at you as much but then shift by catching the light and there's a subtlety so once somebody told me that they thought my eyes were kind of like like flypaper like all these different things stick to them because I'll draw imagery from various components and then you see connections so I'm just showing you that it's like you know Make a sketchbook, collect images, or, I mean, let's, like, now it's like Instagram and Pinterest. I've started, like, having my students do Pinterest boards, and I go and I look at it. So when they're like, I don't know what to do, I don't know, I'm like, well, why don't you look at what is getting your attention? So um, these are collections of things, and how all of a sudden you can find out that you have a, a visual vocabulary, maybe, that you weren't aware of, whether it's from a natural thing like do on a, on a web or uh, the, the silver is like a high fashion contemporary um, dress. So as you see, a lot of 2D and 3D on my, uh, how am I merging those two things? Am I camouflaging? Am I highlighting? Am I moving your eye around? And this is a woman who is a body painter. I'm a hack, and I also reference wallpaper in my work. So um, once I came across her images, I was, of course, you know, enthralled. So you can see the figure in all of them, right? So, uh, you know, I myself was like, okay, how do I take three-dimensional forms that are soup, like truly round, nothing flat, and connect them, merge them together? Uh, in the center, there's that red and it's a pattern but I also thought about a doily right in the center of a table um, that speaks of home but it also is a little is read a little bit like fishnet stockings too you know there's black and there's red the pink's really like shiny like pleather um, so I try to draw from a number of sources when I'm making my decisions Sometimes I just go with my gut, but then I'm trying to also make decisions based on something I would like to reference. 
Um, the way this is done is Scurfido, so that's something I didn't get to today um, for you who were at the demo, but I'll finish it up and I'll leave it. So, sorry, a little side note. And it has more of a block print, and I have two young children, and I've realized in the recent years that I probably look at children's books more than I do at art books. So you got to take what you get and there's some amazing illustrators out there and so I've been able to draw from some of that. So there's a, there's a whimsy to it. And you can begin to abstract, like I have loved that area of the tree. Like, and how you can take that, and I, and in my own work, it starts to become possibly more abstract. So there's a psychological aspect to some of the pieces. Um, so I hope that it isn't something that just simply, like, dazzles and decorates. Uh, I really think that I'm working with drawing and composition and references rather than just decorating forms. Um, yes, these roses are cliche, but I feel like I've put them through this filter and there's sort of like a life and death reference there. Um, there's a lot of subtlety that happens in the work that if you spend some time with it, you notice it. So uh, if you look closely, there's like a positive and negative. The ratio of color is the same, but what becomes the sort of ink blot flower bug thing <laughs> switches from blue to black on each side. Um, my work became more volumetric, volumetric, and I stopped working um, on tabletop platform pedestal and moved to the wall and integrating a space around it. So adding wood, doing a little bit of painting. So I wanted the forms to, like I was just wanting more space to work and I felt like I didn't really have that on this, this plane. Um, so the forms feel buoyant and like they're floating more. If they could, like time passing and floating away. There's like body reference, cloud reference. So this form was influenced by the female form um, if in the structure of a corset. And then also looking at some cake decorating, you can see the delicacy of the edge and that bizarre drawing. So how are things, like how the... Objects or bodies that inspire me are more elongated and dramatic, so having that, that structure of such things like a, as a corset adds to it. So the stylized flowers and scalloped edges are evocative of uh, cakes and lace work, and you can also see the, the flocking on the bottom of that form that peeks out. Um, and it looks like you're like looking under a skirt, and for me, I love the flocking surface because that I remi it reminds me of the inside of a jewelry box and just being a little girl and like getting to go through and dig through my mom's jewelry. So sometimes bizarre illustrations or images may inspire a form. Um, topiaries have always, so, so when I saw that, it was more of like looking up topiaries and then that came out. So this is a Victorian hair wreath. Have you ever seen these or heard of them? Look around. You'll see them every once in a while at, at museums and a lot of times smaller museums or antique shops. So at one point it was a handicraft thing for women to make these flowers from uh, all the hair of people in the family. And a lot of times if somebody died, they would take a lock of hair and create, the, create that and then they would continue to grow. So I want to capture um, softness and ten tenderness in my pieces. So sometimes the curves echo each other or two forms have a relationship together. Uh, you can see some of my color palette, the pastels. One time my, my college 
a studio mate who's a very successful artist. She called, she's like, you've got the Mentos color palette. And I was like, that's great. I'm like, just a little candy. We all need a little candy sometimes. Um, so a little bit of decadence um, and finding, finding that moment of tranquility with my color and then some things pop a little bit more. Uh, here, I worked with hand-cut stencils, and you can see that the, they are layered up with other pattern underneath. So I really like you know, how colors work together, how line quality works together. Um, it, this piece is a little bit more sterile, a little bit more graphic. The profiles of the form. Uh, often I'll begin my pieces with cutting shapes out of paper. And that's sort of my, um, what is it, like, like, for, like word association. Like if somebody's in the uh, writing and they're kind of coming up with words, I would cut out shapes out of paper and I'll pin them on my wall and just move them around and find relationships that work. By layering the surfaces, there's a depth to it and a richness. There's a scale shift often with the lines and the patterns. So by working in pairs, a relationship between the, the forms evolves, which is pretty obvious, like a relationship between people. Um, so I created a series of work that uh, I challenged myself by finding an object that I had to work on or with. So I had collected these things that were inspiring objects, but now I wanted to make sculptures that were incorporating them. So uh, other than, a lot of times when people are working with found objects, they're making and combining them, but I just said, okay, I have this thing, and I'm gonna make a sculpture that works with it. So there's a series that are wall sconces, and I've changed them, added to them, and created forms around them. Once again, it like, has to do with presentation. Um, you'll see some of the line work on these that I paid homage to needlework and the history uh, and the hands that crafted such stunning labors of love. Uh, I'm drawn to the delicacy and precision of the needlework. I myself get lost in that repetitive Meth, uh, like methodical type of work, like honing down the form, drawing with a slip trailer over and over. It's like little moments that weave together to create life. So like the little fragments and small moments, it can, they construct something whole. So once again, high fashion and then frost on the bottom. So the patterns are sometimes very clear, linear, more decorative, occasionally more illustrative, but other marks dissipate to the non-specific and abstract. As a maker, I find great satisfaction in that meditative process of making those marks. Uh, it's a really calm space for me. Like, I'm busy, I teach, I have kids, I have a dog, and, like, when I can go in the studio and I can just get lost in doing some of that, I'm happy with it because they look like they're little angels, and now they're getting so much older. She's five and he's eight, but this is the truth of it. Um, he is, he's very, he thinks he's a, like a naturalist survivalist, and he uh, went into the woods and he came out and he said he made a, nat it was a, he, saw Bear grills, and it was a natural uh, bug repellent and sun protector. So he was doing me a favor by <laughs> rolling in the mud. <laughs> so, so I like to find some quietness in my studio. <laughs> um, this was a series of work at, that really came from, you have to, your studio practice has to evolve and respond and if I took on huge projects, which I sometimes think about and dream about, I don't think I, this point in my life I could, I could do it. So I would, this line of work right here, this series, 
came from working flat and with little pieces of clay and having fun and experimenting. I felt like I could go, I find the time to go in and make these little pieces. And then I had a whole bunch and it was basically like ceramic collage. So um, the wood is all the brown. And so I made all these parts and they were all separate and then I even attached them hovering, post firing. Um, these little pieces that are like a, uh, like a little cameo shape, little oval, um, are fired on nichrome wire, so they literally they hover off of the piece. And so it was really fun because you think that you, in ceramics it goes into the kiln and it's done, or we're like, oh, I can't, the, the glaze can't run because it's going to stick to something. Well, who said you can't use that on purpose? So these were really quite delicate little pieces, these slabs that I punched all out, and then I glazed them and then I stacked them. So I took that rule and I did something intentional. I intentionally broke it and made it do something I wanted. So they were all glazed together and you can see a detail there. And then the beautiful thing about it was I wanted there to feel like you were looking through a haze or looking through lace at flesh or something else or peeking through a curtain. So um, there's all that pattern underneath, but in the end, you're like, how did that get there? Um, so I just threw this in here because I really liked the freedom of playing with these pieces and I thought that they were going to, you know, I first played with them on the table and arranged them like a collage and then I hung them on the wall and I felt like they were just floating. They needed a space around them. There's a detail of that. Um, but then I came, I, you know, I finished, I thought it was done. I even showed them once and then, I, but I wasn't happy. As, so I brought them back into the studio and then made these wooden spaces for them to exist. They needed something to shift from the object to define the space to the wall. They just got lost in the expanse of the wall. So I, I like showing that um, before and after. So I'm going to pick up the pace here just a little bit. So some, some of the more recent work, um, maybe marks that would have once been done by hand, like drawing loops, is I'm, as I'm, I'm sculpting some things like that. So some of my pattern and drawing and marks are becoming more dimensional. This is probably, this is one of my recent, most recent pieces. And I wanted a real control versus uncontrol on it. Because when I'm drawing the uh, floral pattern all over the background, it was really precise. And that's how I handle materials is I get a lot of precision and control the mark. And so it's great to let the kiln shift away and take some of that, um, you know, that bring in a little softness to it. So things are in flux. So there's like, I, otherwise they're a little too sterile. I want there to be like a, a, a liminal state, a little bit of an in-between. So, and I was lucky enough that this was on the cover of a magazine just a month or so ago. So that was good. So, um, anyway. Go make something and get excited. She was screaming because her brother was showing her a crab and that. <laughs>